kid. Seriously. Welcome to another acerbic episode of the Kids Seriously Show. We're the only podcast around that tells you to like what you like. So long as the Neitzel brothers like it too. Otherwise it's half. And as Tavares will tell you, half is shit. Every now and again we get together to discuss the world, play our award winning trivia question, watch movie trailers, discuss other things from Nerdland that might tickle our fancy, and complain about the weather in the Pacific Northwest. I am Maya Madrid, and to my left, it's Fuel's biggest and only fan, it's Luke Neitzel. And to my right, way to the right, it's a man who wanted to be left footed so bad. He forgot how to kick with his right. It's Mark Neitzel. Gentlemen, how are you? I'm excellent, and Fuel actually came up this weekend, and I thought of you the whole time. Did you really? Yeah, because we were talking... I was in Minneapolis, actually, visiting some old friends, and we were talking about, like, shitty music experiences, and it, 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 we started talking about... Um, uh, somehow we started talking about Eve 6, so I got to drop I got to drop the bomb of I Have Eve 6 Guitar Pick that I, that I caught at a show that I think had 45 people at it, or whatever, and uh, one of the one of our friends was like, "Oh my God, I I gave the lead singer a hug too, you know, because she she saw him at a show, and then she was like, and I even did you remember that really shitty band Fuel? I saw them too live. <laughs> I was like, yes, I do know that shitty band Fuel, and I really like one of their songs. I know because we had to listen to it eight times on the on the trip from uh, seriously lacrosse oh, all the way to Minneapolis. You mean, hemorrhage in my hands. It is the I like that song. Well, it's their only song. Well, they also had Shimmer. Shimmer was actually first and arguably more popular. But I just want to point out on that the the horribleness of that drive for you because um you know what a pain it must have been to have a guy volunteer to drive you at no charge to your hometown 3 hours away. That wasn't Wait, the same trip. You need, oh, it was a different trip. No, it was a different oh, trip. I yeah. take it back then. Okay. Never mind. Are you you want to get into the part about you getting a ticket going through Oh, Lake in Lake City. Yeah. Oh, yeah. City boy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Sorry, that was great. I knew. Thank you for that, though. I mean, yeah. those were uh, those were my poor days. Oh wait, I'm still having poor <laughs> days. <laughs> yeah, but at least on that trip, a cat didn't need your cell phone charger. And yeah, that's how I'm it. doing. My uh, my cat ate my cell phone charger this week, and then also ate uh, my cord for my internet connection. So. I'm going to be without internet until we can find out uh, how to get these cords. My wife went to the the, locus wall, the closest Walmart to try to get um, a cord, and they, they don't have them anymore. So I'm totally screwed as far as the internet. So wait, wait, I'm about to sign wait, off and just disappear from the world. Wait, did she, your cat just like chew through them? Or are we talking actual ingestion? You're going to have to go through the poop to make sure you passed it. Eat. Um, one, I don't care because I hate that cat right now. No, he just chewed through it. He didn't chew up the cord and he just went right through it. So I'm just kidding. I do love my cat, but he really pisses me off right now. So we'll, we'll have an update next week as to whether you still have a cat. Maybe I might disappear off the face of the earth. Who knows? Mm. Well, I am really tired because one of the things I didn't realize before I moved up to Portland is that it rains. Well, you know, it actually hasn't rained for, I think almost a week now oh wow yeah we're not supposed to get rain until wednesday and then it's supposed to rain the entire time that my in-laws are here for thanksgiving so we'll all be trapped inside nice. real quick i have an update i just got a text message that uh some friends in my hometown or in the town that i live in have an ethernet cable and are gonna drop it off tomorrow so looks like crisis is averted all right sorry please continue okay so, but I didn't realize that I'm moving a significant number of latitudes northward. So now the sun sets at 4.30 here, which I haven't had to deal with in 15, 16 years. So by the time 6 o'clock comes around, it's pitch dark outside, and I feel like I should be in bed. And so Vampire The eternal clock is all messed up. Oh, um, that sucks, man. It was pitch black here at 4.45, so. <laughs> right, right. But see... You're used to it. You never get used to that, by the way. You've never ventured out and explored the greater world like I have, all right? And so it's an adjustment Uh, for me. We did spend a week in Portugal together on a honeymoon, so... And one one time I drove all the way to Windsor, Canada, because you could drink legally at 19. So I've seen the world. I've been places. (laughs) No, I. I, you know, it's funny because for my work, I had to go to Texas the other week. And talked to a lot of my coworkers that are down there and, and everyone, I was the only guy from the North. So, 
they ask you a million questions. Like they haven't, like a lot of them have never really seen snow or, you know, they get snow in Dallas, but it's, it melts, you know, right away and you, they get a dusting and it, it cancels everything. So they always ask a ton of questions about the snow and the cold. And it's, it's not the snow and the cold that's bad about winter. Like I, not a problem with any of that at all. It's the dark at four thirty, and then the yeah. sun comes up at, at eight or whatever that you, you deal with. I'm going to start a, a political party and we are going to abstain from every single vote and every single issue. But all we're going to do is push the elimination of fallback in in time mm-hmm. changes so that the people up here don't have to suffer anymore. Yeah. I Well, you know what? Maybe we should just uh, invade and, and push our whole country south so that we can just avoid this whole problem altogether. It would but, solve the wall problem, wouldn't it? There you go. But it's just, you know, it's <clears throat> when you're moving and you're changing, you think of all of these adjustments you're going to have to make and all these changes. And, yeah, I knew it was going to rain a lot and there wasn't going to be um, a lot of sunlight. But it was just one of those things I completely forgot about and got up here and it's just really knocking me on my ass that I'm just constantly tired because it gets dark so early. So um, that's how I'm doing right now. Well, hopefully, too, at your new job, you have, you're by a window, too, because I remember that one of my first jobs. Well, it was in college. I worked in a cube, you know, a office building, but you're in a mess of cubicles and my cubicle wasn't anywhere near a window. So you get to work at, you know, 730 and it's pitch blackout and then you leave at 430 and it's pitch blackout. So it was like my 45 minute lunch break is the only time I saw the sun for the entire day. Yeah, no, I've got one small window, but it's um, on the side of a hill with massive tree overgrowth. So I don't really get any light through that, even in the middle of the day. So in this I'm ab- pretty screwed on that front. In this abyss of darkness, I do have some good news for you, Mark. Oh, go ahead. Part- Portland is the uh, the current hometown of uh, former pavement frontman Stephen Malcolmus. So even as you're stumbling around the dark, there always is the off chance you may run into him. It, it's also the home of Matt Groening. So oh, oh. Hate, well, hopefully there aren't a lot of Indian so. people around then. Yeah. That show so much. But but you know it's really funny because we're driving around and we're exploring and when he was creating The Simpsons, all of the characters were last names were coming from streets in Portland. Oh so really? You drive down you go from you know, you're driving down twenty third and you cross Flanders Avenue and then you're uh, across Lovejoy Avenue and Terwilliger oh. Street and it's just it's really weird. And he's up here, so yeah, you know, I could run into him at some point too. That, that's funny because I remember going to visit our, our cousin Matt out in Pittsburgh when he lived there and how much of uh, Imagination Land and Mr. Rogers is modeled after things in Pittsburgh yeah. since that's where he was from. So like some of the things are directly taken out of there. So yeah. Good times. Yeah. Speaking of good times, we should get to our award-winning game show. Am I right? Am I wrong? Just You're wrong. Let's get to Jim Jeffords' favorite game show. It's Am I Right or Am I Wrong? In true American style, our contestants are going to offer their earnest opinions, which will either be taken as fact or immediately mocked. Here's how the two-player version of our game works. There are seven questions, which Mark is going to administer tonight as our champion, Luke Neitzel, takes on the challenger, me. Mark will ask us each a question, flip-flopping the order serpentine style. If one of these guys guesses right, the right answer, they're going to get the point. If neither do, Mark is going to pick the answer he likes best. Mark, to you. All right, gentlemen. Strap in. Let's do this. Question number one. So we record these on Sunday nights, and last week we recorded the day before Stan Lee died, which is a pretty big topic, the kind of thing we usually would discuss, but we didn't really cover that. And because obviously it happened after we recorded. So I'm bringing it up now, even though it's kind of old news at this point. So for those of you out there who don't know, Stan Lee was the first editor in chief of Marvel comics. And he was of course, co-creator on some of the most iconic comic book characters in the history of the United States. Um, Spider-Man, Fantastic Four, go down the list. You know them all. Uh, now, after he died, uh, of course, there was also there's all the usual adulations for him, you know, as always happens whenever somebody famous dies. And there was also some criticism as well. Um, most recently, Bill Maher, of all people, wrote a blog post 
making fun of Americans for caring that he died and saying that grown men liking comic books is the reason why Trump was able to get elected in the United States. Um, okay, thanks. Um, also, too, there was some criticism because apparently in his later years, he may have been a bit abusive and hands on with some of nurses who were attending to him. Uh, honestly, I don't know enough about that. Uh, so I'm not going to get into it. But, of course, the biggest criticism that came up is the age-old one uh, about how much credit he took for creating characters versus how much should have gone to his collaborators, specifically Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko. Uh, this is an ongoing thing. It you know, hasn't been settled for decades despite lawsuits, you know, countless thing pieces online, et cetera, et cetera. But I think everybody can agree that when they were paired together, either um, Stan and Jack or Stan and Steve, they brought out the best in each other and they created art that really transcended the medium. Um, because you look at what they did together versus what they did apart. And what they did apart never approached what they were able to do together. M so minus the Pam Anderson collaboration, Stripperella. Well, yes. Yes, that is a given. So this is making me think of artistic collaborations. And so my question to you both for number one is what is the greatest art, uh, Stanley and Jack aside or Stanley and Steve aside, what is the greatest artistic collaboration that when the people work together created, created absolutely amazing art and when they were split apart, they created shit. Ooh, that that's hard with the caveat on the end because I had I knew where, I I thought I knew where you were going with that just great collaborations and I had I had uh, an answer in line and and now that doesn't work because I I was gonna actually go with uh, Paul Newman and and Robert Redford because whenever I think they pair up the movies they make together generally far sub, far surpass what they do apart and they like their chemistry together I think is. You don't really find that among actors, but they also do really good things without each other. So now I'm I'm forced with trying uh, to to come with uh, something else. So I'm gonna go I'm gonna go musical. I feel semi good with this answer, though I I'm not sure if it's one that's gonna please Mark. And I am going to go with um, a, a band I really enjoyed in the '90s that probably isn't the most famous of bands in the '90s. Um, but that is Stone Temple Pilots, which I, I was a band I really enjoyed. I thought uh, I, I liked their first album, but it got a lot of criticism for being kind of similar to other bands of the time. And then their second album, Purple, they branched out from that. And I think they put out one of the best albums of the 90s. That was amazing. But um, their third album was pretty good, too. Their third and their fourth album are albums that I, I really liked. I really enjoyed everything that they did together. When they when they broke up, which they did multiple times because of Steve is Steve Scott Weiland's drug issues, uh, they would go on and do things. So Stone Temple Pilots on their own got a different lead singer and made a band called Talk Show, who just sucked. It it was it was bad. You know, it was it was knockoff Stone Temple Pilots. It was less creative instrumentally, and it was also. Um, uh, you know, bad, bad lyrics. And then Steve Weiland or Scott Weiland, I don't know why I keep saying, oh, so Steve Weiland's the guy I work with. Scott Weiland would, uh, would put out solo albums and be in things like Velvet Revolver. And I, you know, I, I get that some people might like the nostalgia of a band like Velvet Revolver, but it does, which is a members of Guns N' Roses other than Axl Rose with Scott Weiland there. It did nothing for me. And then they would come back together and do like a reunion show. And I get to hear that on XM and I'd be like, God, if you guys could just fucking get along like the stuff you put out together, I really, really like. And whenever you do anything solo or apart, it just falls apart for me. I'm also going to go music here. Um, and I might lose this on a technicality. I'm going to go Lennon McCartney uh, for the Beatles and throw Harrison in there. Um, when they were together, obviously one of the greatest bands of all time. After they broke up, I, I think personally, I like Lennon's music the most post breakup, but I, I like the first album that is actually like a, a triple album that Harrison put out. Um, and I like some of the songs from, from Paul McCartney, but, but apart, they never even got close um, to what they were as a band. And, and for my money, when you have a, a song written by Lennon and sung by Lennon with Paul McCartney on the background, 
um, especially in some of the ones where, where he gets a little bit more creative on, on the bass. Um, there's, there's nothing better than Lennon McCartney and George Harrison. Okay. So Luke, I yep. liked your answer, but we've established previously in the rules of this game that if something's written down, Oh man. Winner. And so Maya gets the point because I had Lennon McCartney. Because the, the, you think you think I well, let's see what what baffles me about that is I I totally get the it's not as good as when they're together but I don't think I could qualify their solo work as shit. See, I I think if you listen to Lennon's stuff and you take away Imagine and Instant Karma, and it's not that good. Yoko's all up in it. It's excessively weird. There's no hooks. I mean, it's. When people talk about Lennon post the Beatles, they're talking about him and his interviews and the things he stood for. They're not really talking about his music. And as far as McCartney goes, I mean, when he's paired with Lennon, you get Yesterday and Hey Jude. And as soon as he's on his own, you get fucking banned on the run and nod your head. So Okay, I'm just going to throw this out there, which is probably going to lose me every point moving forward. But I, I would put banned on the run up there with most Beatles songs. Oh, I love no. Band on the Run. I love the middle part where it uses well, that like is the, the minor part. chords. I like, that's yeah. phenomenal. But I would agree with you, Mark. Um, so, obviously, you've picked it. Well, yes. I'm just I'm just saying about Lennon, like, like it never, I, I think the competition between the two was so visceral, and you had Harrison, like, really attempting to kind of break through that, especially in the latter part of, of their well, careers of the Beatles. Like, Well, and I think it's obvious, too, that Lennon was very experimental, but you always had McCartney to pull him back. Right. And say, okay, we need this to be a little more poppy, a little more of a hook. And if there so, wasn't Lennon, the whole damn thing would have been show tunes. It would have been right. Awful. Whereas if it was Paul McCartney, it would have just been "I want to hold your hand" over and over and over again. So, point my question number two. Uh, next week we are probably not going to be recording. I'm just tossing this out to you guys as well as to our fans. Because at 4.30 Pacific Standard Time, I am going to be attending the MLS Western Conference semi or finals, leg number one of Portland Timbers versus Sporting Kansas City. Uh, I've actually got tickets to sit in the Timbers Army. I'm not sure how that's going to go. It's going to be an experience. <laughs> it's going to go awesome is what it's going to go. I, possibly. But I, I also very much enjoy sitting down and watching games, and that's harder to do from a sporter section, especially when there's as many flags and smoke bombs. And but it's something you got to do once, at least. Exactly. That was my thought. It's like, I'm going to do it once. I'm going to do it during a playoff game. So I've got MLS on the brain. And not only do I have MLS on the brain, but a lot of presidents and general managers do as well, because we're seeing some big coaching moves going on. So we've got, looks like virtually certain that Tata Martino of Atlanta is going to be going to the Mexican national team. Um, Greg Berhalter from Columbus Crew apparently didn't even have to interview. He was just handed the USMNT job. And now we just got word that Oscar Pereja is probably going to be leaving for Tijuana, which means next season Dallas can go back to being completely irrelevant and ignorable, which I'm very excited about. So my question to both of you is, since we're uh, practically uh, into MLS silly season anyway, what is the next major, and that's the important word here, next major coaching move in MLS? Either somebody coming in, somebody going out. But it's got to be major. So, you know, Adrian Heath getting fired in Minnesota is not major. Okay, I, I'm first thing I just want to say this. I, I actually really enjoy watching FC Dallas. And I think no matter who their coach is, they have a lot of young talent. They were my favorite team to watch. It wasn't one of my teams. And so I always want to say that, but the coaching, I think it's about time that Bruce arena comes back. I think Bruce arena is going to come back and, and I don't know exactly where it's going to be. I don't think it's going to be FC Dallas. So, um, let's, I'm just going to say, yeah, he'll go to Columbus, Bruce arena. So I'm just going to say, I hate that answer. Cause I, I, I think, I think I hate it from the the point that I think I think Bruce's time is done. I think his his point of being relevant has kind of been surpassed, and I and I also think from a, a fan standpoint, that isn't a name that generates excitement anymore. Like that's not a major a major move that's going to excite national fandom and press. Can I just say like last time he was in MLS, I mean he was very successful. So I don't want to like get in the in the way of your answer here, but like I mean. 
he was like we said that when he was coming to the galaxy. Does he have it anymore? And, and he won. Now, granted, he had a lot of money behind him. Um, when like, was the last galaxy title? I don't remember the exact year. Almost ten you years were, ago. So wasn't that long? It, you were at my house. It's been a, it's been a while. Well, I mean, I don't, it's been a while. His his back end with the galaxy was not very good. They were a declining team, and he, as he always does, and to success and to failure, relied too heavily on aging talent, and then. Not only his tenure with the the return to the U.S. national team, but I think his handling post failure of not making the World Cup was an abomination. Like I don't no disagree. no credit, just total thing. And I think he has done so much wrong in the last four to five years that I I don't think like I, I'm not saying he might not he wouldn't be the worst coach in the world. And I think if you're the Chicago Fire or another team that struggles to be relevant that it wouldn't make sense for you, but I don't think it's the, the splash making headline that it was 10 years ago. Um, when we, we think about Bruce Arena and hopefully we'll think about him again, because I don't, I hope this doesn't ruin his legacy because Bruce Arena did a lot of great things for us soccer, but I think the taste in all of our mouths about him right now is so bad that, uh, we need some time. I, I think it was too. The first time he left the national team. I mean, people had bad taste in their mouth when it came to him then, and then he was able to rebuild his career. Not, and change not his like image. this. Not like this. I, they were very different scenarios. I think there were a lot of people that didn't want him to go, and I think that everyone was excited for him to immediately jump into MLS, where now he is reviled by a lot of American fans and fans of, of U.S. soccer. So that's my the sidetrack. It's going to be the announcement of someone coming in, and it's going to be what Atlanta does, because Atlanta makes... Splashes. Atlanta is not going to hire, you know, the the Robin Frasers of the world. You know, they're going to be the ones that go out and do something bold, whether it's good or bad. They demonstrate that with their transfers. They've demonstrated that by bringing Taza Martinez in to start with. Um, and there's only a couple teams in this league that I think really make splashes, and those are LAFC, which has already got Bradley locked down, and. Um, the other one being uh, New York City FC, which has already got, uh, it looks like Torrance, and I like the Milwaukee Torrance, but I know that's not his actual name, but the fire, former uh, Bayern Munich coach. So it's going to be Atlanta FC. It's going to be who they bring in. Um, I'm rambling a little bit right now as I try to think of a big name of who they, they could bring in that's going to be that splash, because I don't know of it offhand, but I, I, I'm going to throw this out there and I'm going to say, uh, oh, I hope he doesn't already have a job. He may. I'm going to say that they might bring in uh, uh, Mexico, former Mexico team manager, throw throw weird crap at the wall, but somehow it kind of works, make you know douchebags like Matt Doyle really upset. I'm going to say they bring in uh, a Juan Carlo Osorio type that... Uh, that, that they're the ones that are going to make a headline. That's for sure. It's not going to be who the crew bring in. It's not going to be who the fire bring in if they let go of Hanovich. It's going to be what Atlanta does. I'm a little hurt that you said it's not going to be the fire, but whatever. It's definitely not going to be the fire. Okay. Well, Maya has gone two for two in picking what I had written down. Wow. I actually, well, almost. I actually have Bruce Arena to Colorado I instead like, like of Columbus. Sense. Wow, I guess we have different versions of what major means. Because I, I have, I have oh, Bruce Arena and the Colorado Rapids. One thing everyone hates and one thing nobody remembers exists. Right, but nice see, stadium. he's a big name. He's got a pedigree in MLS. I agree with everything you said about him, um, about his legacy, about the fact that I don't think he will be successful in MLS 3.0 or whatever we're in now. But I think he's enough of a name and will be in a team that's been ignored long enough that when he comes in, it will be a big splash. Um, I mean, I think whoever Atlanta gets, it will be big in that market, and MLS will trip all over themselves because MLS trips all over themselves to promote anything that Atlanta or LAFC do. But I think as far as getting fans talking, as far as generating conversation for good or ill, I think it's Bruce Arena coming back. So good job, Maya. We're at that. Two to nothing right now. Don't shake your head at me, all right? It's a bad okay. answer. It's a never, bad answer all I've around. I've never been up two oh. over Luke before, yeah. so this is... Shut up, Stanley Tucci. <laughs> all right, question number three. It has been announced that the Spice Girls are reuniting and going to be going on tour again. Now, as 
all fans of the, the Spice Girls know, there's only four of them committed at this point because apparently Posh Spice, Victoria Beckham, has decided that her job of marrying somebody really rich and famous makes her too good to hang out with these other mediocre talents. So my question to you, when this tour begins, who should replace Posh as the fifth Spice Girl? Is this me for this is me I first? Ask you, Luke. So so this is the thing about Posh Spice over all the different Spice Girls is like she can't sing. Like she was literally hired much much like you're just kind of saying with her marriage. Like she was hired because she's very good looking and she could stand there and be a model. Like not that I can go that deep into the Spice Girl catalog, but like if if you listen to their stuff, because I had a girlfriend in high school who was very into them, she gets no solos, she gets no whatever. Like she is just a background singer, but she's in there because she was the like the model esque good looking one. Though they're all good looking, so whatever. But um, so it doesn't it doesn't really matter. So I just thought of the the closest carbon copy of that that I could, and that that's that's Kate Beckinsale, right? Like she hits she hits all the bases. Like who gives a crap if she can sing? She's British. She's brunette. No one really cares what she does or, like, respects her, like, talent as an actress. But, like, you're never upset when she's standing next to someone who you might be more interested in the performance of. So, like, and she's not doing anything, I don't think, right now. So, like, just throw Kate Beckinsale in there. And you know what? Don't even tell people it's Kate Beckinsale. Just give her give her a bob and a leather miniskirt and be like, hey, look, we got Victoria back. And, and see how many stops you make before someone actually notices that it's not her. Uh I agree a lot with what Luke said here about about Posh Spice. She's always the, the least talented. Everybody knows that the that Ginger Spice is the is the heart and soul, um, and Scary Spice is 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 kind of the McCartney of the group. <laughs> so and, um, and and Sporty is and the Sporty actual. Is, the, yeah. She's the George Harrison actually yeah. because she actually had a very good voice, but she was the least attractive and got treated like she yeah. you know. So she got kind of pushed aside for the kind of two more glamorous ones in in Scary and and Ginger. Yeah. Um, you know, and baby was Ringo, right? Cause she right, was like, just right. happy to be there. Like right. give her whatever she wants. Like, you know, she don't care. Like, I'm glad we've broken this out. This is really fun. We should, maybe we should turn this into a Spice Girls a related episode. podcast. Yeah. Um, but my answer is going to take a little bit of a left turn. I, I wouldn't want to, um, add anybody. I'd want to just keep it the same. And if Posh doesn't want to show up, uh, you just don't replace her. You just keep on going with, with the group that's there. I wouldn't want to adulterate the, um, the the memory of what the Spice Girls were. I'm so annoyed because I know I'm, I'm about to lose on this point because I'm going to guess the answer he has written down is a hologram of Posh Spice. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that would have been awesome. Um, you do actually get the point, Luke. Woo! That's good. One, because Maya didn't really answer the question. Two, and I like your answer better than mine. My answer was actually Mariah Carey. For the sole reason that I want to see her react publicly to being called Old Spice. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the the two shows before she quit that tour, like <laughs> it would have been the biggest <laughs> crazy ass train wrecks you would have ever seen in your life. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna stick with music here for uh, question number four, and I was thinking about this because I am on the um, flogging Molly. Um, mail list and i got an email saying announcing that they're doing a cruise tour of the bahamas in november of next year and so not only are they going to be performing on this cruise boat but apparently they're bringing the dropkick murphys with them and that is this is the first time i've ever actually thought of one of those celebrity cruises as being something i would actually do so on the flip side of that, because I got to be thinking about punk music and then my mind kind of wandered off, and I came up with this question. Who is the bigger insult to the entire concept of punk music, The Offspring or Blink-182? Oh, my gosh. Um, I, I don't particularly like and either why? band. Um I'm going to go, and, and I, I hate to say it because I like some of their songs. They're, they're catchy, but, I mean, as far as what punk stood for in the 1980s and everything that it meant to me in the 1990s, I would say that I was more offended by Blink-182. And I think um, at least The Offspring had some sort of semblance of anti-establishment or sort of FU attitude, where, where Blink-182 kind of had 
the song structure, um, but didn't really represent anything that that I had come to like out of punk music. So I'm gonna go Blink 182. Which I, so I'm gonna go I'm gonna go the opposite route. I'm gonna go the Offspring on this, and and I did like Blink 182 when I was in high school. It's not a band I can revisit because their music is geared towards high school kids. So when you're 38 and you listen to it, you have nothing to hold on to. But the the reason that I'm gonna pick is 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 kind of what you touched upon, but I, what I think is the offspring put out a, a first couple albums that were one thing that were trying to be those kind of eighties punk ideals. I don't think they ever really hit it, but they were trying to be that. And then they got songs that were popular and they went, okay, now we can turn into a gimmick band so we can put out depthless gimmick songs like pretty fly for a white guy, where it's really more about the music video than the song original prankster, all this just horrific dumb shit they put on concerts, and I know this because I actually went because I wanted to see the Dropkick Murphys, and they opened, and they would play a twenty or a, a ten thousand seat arena, and the Offspring would charge eighty dollars a ticket, and would play for sixty minutes, even though they had eight albums or whatever, um, and they would just play these, you know, these this just kind of sellout garbage. Like they remind me of um, Sugar Ray, like in a lot of ways, because. Sugar Ray was a metal band when it started, and the album that Fly is on is actually very metal, except for Fly. And then Fly was big, so they were like, "We'll just make that song." And if you want to make money that way, more more power to you. But like, don't don't expect people that were there looking for the other thing to stick with you because you're putting out poppy garbage that I don't like. And Blink One Eighty Two was a band where I saw them. They put out two albums before they got really really popular, and I I bought both those albums before the the popular one came out. And whether you like what they did or they don't do, that's what they started doing. And they just did that. And it's more the MTVs of the world lumping them into a certain category, I think, than them really being like, we're trying to be the Sex Pistols, but we're going to then make this popular band. They just were like, we wear skateboarder pants and we make the same type of music. And now suddenly we won't, what we make is popular. So now everyone hates us, even though we haven't changed. Where the Offspring are a band who who were one thing and then thought, well, we can make more money. So we're going to completely flip and be this other shittier thing just to make money. So I will go with the offspring being a bigger affront to all those things for me. All right. And four questions in Luke has tied the game. He is absolutely right. Um, in his assessment of both the offspring and blink One Eighty Two. The only thing I have to add to it is that to their credit, I don't think Blink-182 ever took themselves as seriously no. as the Offspring did. The the other thing I would say is if you actually look at Blink-182's music, so that, you know they put, they put out Enema of the State, which is the one that got really popular. Like as their albums progressed, they actually got more air quotes punk on their later albums than they were on their earlier albums. Like, it became more, like, rock-edged and angrier and all that as they moved along, because I I think they got angry by the backlash they got from being popular. I just want to say that I'm embarrassed to be part of this conversation with the knowledge of the offspring and Blink-182 <laughs> well, that you're dropping. Respect that that's, for that you like what yeah. you like. But God damn, and, I hate that music. And I'm that, I'm that guy who, you know, like, I, I went to every pop-punk concerts in high school because I you know we were at that age where it became popular like really popular and I had a lot I worked 40 hours a week in high school because I loved my job um so I had a lot of disposable income and we spent all that money going to First Ave and to the Quest and to all these clubs in Minneapolis to go see Unwritten Law and Goldfinger and Less Than Jake and like all those type of bands like that was the thing that my friends were into that I was into and it, you know, I, I don't care if it doesn't have indie cred, like it's, it's great it's memories about indie for cred. me. It's fun. I hate the music. It's not about indie cred. Well, so, you know, yeah. I got to turn it into the, the Maya, you know, going with the old school sure. or the, the underground shit. But let me say, I'd take muster plug U- USV or the blue meanies over any of those bands any days. And that's what, that's sure. what punk meant to me. I don't know. Well, okay. And yeah. And I've seen minor threats and, uh, you know, no effects and, you know, like, you know, list off who, whoever you want. I've been to a lot. I've seen the Blue Meanies. Like, I've seen a lot of that stuff. The thing was, is that I went to all of it because I had lots of money and I lived 20 minutes from 18 clubs. So I was able to go do that. So, yeah, I know a lot about that genre because that's what we did when I was that age. Right, I don't listen I to don't any of it bitter. now, to be honest. Uh, don't be bitter. Shake it off. We've still no, I'm not bitter about the... Left. 
You can come back. No, I know. I'm not bitter yeah. about loss. I just don't like the music. Well, and I, can I, can I, I know we're getting tangenty, but I want to explain the difference between you and me when it comes to music. In my yeah. opinion, you can tell me if I'm totally wrong. Okay. I probably but will. You, and that's fine. But I don't, I don't understand music. I can't tell you specific things about music. I can't even describe in good vocal terms what I like about specific songs because I don't have the vocabulary to express what I like and I don't like. I just kind of like things. I'm 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 an Adam Sandler fan of music. Like and I'm aware of that and I'm fine with that. Yeah. I realize that the stuff I like might like I like you get music. You play music. You are in bands. You I remember you talking about um Oasis, who is a band I really enjoyed and saw and you started breaking down like why you didn't like them and like blah 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 and I was like I understood five words out of this conversation. But when I turn their songs on, they make me happy. Like that, Are you sure that's sure it was just... Oasis? I've always kind of liked Oasis. Oh, you told yeah, me you didn't like them anymore because of like they played in the same key or tempo or something that okay. I don't I don't get that annoyed oh, I, you I, that I, they I, kept yeah, yeah. That they kept doing. But but that's like you know, like I tend to be snobbier about movies, whether it's deserved or not, because I feel like I get those on a higher level. And I don't get music on a higher level. I just get what makes me I happy. Feel, yeah, we're probably the exact reverse because I get the music on a different level in movies. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I like Solo. So, um, and we'll get to a little bit of this later <laughs> when we get to the trailer. So, yeah, this has been fascinating. But back to me. <laughs> oh, yeah, Mark's here. Hey, Mark. I have question number five. And we're staying with music. Oh my god! Because so this is weird too because I've gotten two music questions right. This is just kind of a theme. And you here. got MLS. So, apropos of nothing, what song has the worst lyrics of all time? Thank God you're first because I got to think about this one. <clears throat> well, I know we the, the I know a band both popped into our head at the at the same moment or whatever because I'm sure we're both thinking 311 has the worst the worst lyrics of all time. I know chill. there has to be chill. Uh, well, and to spend half your song, like, if you have to write half your songs per album defending your songs for music critics, then, like, <laughs> maybe it isn't necessarily the music critics problem that, that your lyrics are so, so bad. But I, I kind of feel like their lyrics are bad, but it's kind of accepted bad, and, um, you, you, you go off of that. Um, oh, man, this is a tough one. Who does have the worst, the worst lyrics of all time? Uh, oh, no, Okay. The the worst lyrics of all time for me is Creed because that is a that is a a band that is faking an interest in Christianity to appeal to people who like simplistic Christianity to steal their money. Like that is that is the sole purpose of that band. Those lyrics are things my kids could write, um, or they're just we we took some Pearl Jam lyrics, we we clicked uh, synonyms for six of the words, and then we substituted five words with Jesus. And we redid it. So their their lyrics are horrendous, and they're not only horrendous because they're just simplistic and stupid, but they're disingenuous to steal money from people who believe in something. Like that that's the worst for me. For me, I don't know I'm embarrassed to say I don't know the the artist, but there's the the song where the, the lyrics are um oh shit. I can't even remember it's from the sixties. Fuck, I'm totally failing on this. Um, yeah, the, the you said 60s and it knocked me away out of the, helping you. It's the, you know, like, I'd like to change the world. Hey, Luke, why don't we play some uh, Jeopardy music here while we give him some time to think I about it? Oh, man, we, I, I just deleted it, but I had a very I had a very nice drop of The Waiting by Tom Petty for moments just like this. Did but, you? Uh, why did you delete it? I don't know. I, my computer was running out of memory. So um, I hope no one ever asks us for the back episodes because they're all gone, baby. I can't, I can't think of that one. So I'm just gonna have to shoot from the hip here and say, man, Debbie Gibson's shit really pissed me off even as a child. So I'm gonna go Debbie <laughs> Gibson. <laughs> Which you're probably gonna win because I'm gonna guess the answer is actually Taylor Swift. Well, you're wrong. You got the point, Luke. Woo! Because you're wrong. Uh, but not because you're wrong. Um, you gave a, a reasoned well thought out answer that I agree with. Um, Maya just kind of punted this one. I'm, I'm sorry, but she did. I did. Um, it's not the answer I had. The answer I had actually ties back to question number uh, one. It's Paul McCartney. Hmm? Talking about freedom. No, 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 no. Oh no. God. This is, this is uh, a collaboration that we didn't discuss. With Michael Jackson? It was, it was actually 
David Lee Roth and Eddie Van Halen, who together make some tremendous music. And apart, we get these lyrics. Let me get on. Let me get on. Let me get on some of that. Shake it up. Bake it up. Nice. Uh, I so love my baby's pound cake. Wow. Yeah, that's. Yeah, I had pound cake by Van Halen as the dumbest that's... lyrics of all time, and they're pretty stupid. But I like your your rationale for Creed. So uh, Luke takes the lead. He's up three to two. I, I'm just gonna say that I like but... Sammy Hagar Van Halen better than David Lee Roth Van Halen, but I hate all versions of Van Halen. <laughs> But at least, but at least Eddie's song, like his riffs and stuff, were better with well, David Lee. Roth. And like seeing Van Halen live with David Lee Roth would be a lot of fun. Where like seeing Eddie or uh, seeing um, Sammy Hagar with Van Halen doesn't seem like it would be any fun like, at all. Yeah. And but both would be better than Gary Sharon. Okay, True. question number six. Oh, more than uh, words should have been my answer. Now that I. That's another Sugar Ray esque band, right? Like they yeah. made one song that was different than all their other songs, but that song was popular, so we'll just fucking change. Yeah. Friend Question of the show number Garth six. loves that song. Oof. Question number six. In the news this week, Trump awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom to several people, including the dead Elvis Presley and the alive and totally worthy and deserving Alan Page. Uh, former Minnesota Supreme Court Justice and Minnesota Vikings, great. But it, it's widely understood in certain circles that these were basically just cover awards, and the only one he was really interested in giving were to Antonin Scalia and to Miriam Adelson, who is a wife of GOP's mega donor Sheldon Adelson. And it was essentially just a, a thank you for giving millions and millions of dollars to one political party. So I, I feel comfortable in saying that his giving her the award has cheapened the award's meaning overall. Now, this is not an uncommon thing in America, um, especially when it comes to awarding art. We have tended to give out awards to things that didn't deserve it and as a result have cheapened the value of that award. Now, I know you're thinking I'm going with Grammys. <laughs> but I'm not, because the Grammys never had any value to begin with. Um, we're going to the granddaddy of them all, the Oscar Awards. And my question is, what is the greatest injustice in the history of the Oscar Awards that has cheapened and devalued that award? So I get this one first, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm going to go with the Return of the King as the best uh best picture sort of like the the lifetime achievement award for lord of the rings and those movies really don't stand up well um i don't know movies like you guys so i don't know what was up against it um but i th that movie's really bad uh i'm desperately w wondering what the um the Oh, oh no! For, I was about to be like, "What did the artist go against with?" It's, it's, it's the English Patient, Pete Fargo. I mean, the English Patient is horrific. It is one of the most boring. Just that—that that is a movie that like that nobody likes, nobody enjoys, but everyone is worried that they're going to sound dumb if they say they don't like it, even though we all hate it communally. And it, and it beat Fargo. Like, stop! Like, stop! Like that. That is. Oh, that that makes me want to vomit when I think about it. Like that is that is. I mean, you know, you can think of other. You know, like Titanic beat L.A. Confidential, which is ridiculous. The artist beats something, which is ridiculous. But the English is the patient, artist the silent one. Yeah, oh, which I like hate that it. Movie. And, and I like silent movies. Okay, so it's not a like I can't handle a silent movie or a black and white movie or you know like whatever like. I own probably seven silent movies in this basement. Oh, I'm sorry, studio that we're in right now. But uh, the studio is in the basement. Well, yeah, touche. Um, but the English patient beating Fargo is insanity. It's pure insanity. I, you, there's not a logical reason you can tell me that the English patient is better on any level. Um, well, you both got the question wrong. Although Luke did mention the correct answer, which was Titanic beating L.A. Confidential. Um, the English patient is a bad movie, but at least it attempted something new. Uh, it attempted something that I, I think has merit, even though it failed badly. And I do think that there are good performances in that as well. Whereas Titanic oh. is pure 
shit. I so okay, so I I actually disagree with you on this. What well, not not from the standpoint that L.A. Confidential isn't a significantly better movie, but Titanic is a visual musical uh, triumph. Like it's very very innovative visually, and those visuals still hold up today. Uh, the music is a saving grace of that movie because it is excellent. And I do think that despite the horrific, almost George Lucas-esque dialogue they were given, that Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio and Kathy Bates, to a certain extent, do do more than any human could ever ask another human to do with that material. So I I, I disagree. I, I disagree with that. I think Titanic has some some saving graces that are more than the English patient, which is why if you polled a hundred Americans, ninety nine of them know what Titanic is, and two of them know what the English patient is. I never right. saw either movie, so fuck them both. Oh, only only two points. Um, one, if you polled Americans, Donald Trump won the electoral college, so that in and of itself, is but not, not the popular vote. That's that's going to sway me. Number two, you take the music out of that movie, nobody sits through it to get to the visuals at the end. I mean, that movie is 99.9% music. Well, but, and but the English patient's 99% shots of sand. And I hate sand. It's coarse. It gets everywhere. It's, so, so neither of you get the point. So we are three to two going into the final question with Luke in the lead. So here's your next question. Madison, Wisconsin, recently, as in today, unveiled the logo for their new USL soccer team. Now, they're going with the title Madison, or Forward Madison, uh, which apparently is based on the state motto or something. State motto. Oh, okay. Of Wisconsin. Um, it's on our, our, our minted coin or whatever from our quarter, our Wisconsin quarter. Well, And, and I, our seal. I, I, and I bet that the good people of Wisconsin have as much trouble spelling forward as they do spelling Wisconsin. But whatever. The crest, though, features a pink plastic flamingo, which I guess is the result of some drunks at Madison in the 60s putting a bunch of flamingos on a hill. Because that apparently what passes for creativity in the middle of nowhere. Um, so... This got me thinking, what is the worst branding in American sports, in professional American sports? And also, there's a couple caveats to this, too. One, I'm talking the, the five major leagues. Um, it's not fair to pick on, you know, second and third tier division teams like the USL because they have different standards. Um, also, too, um, I want to make it clear that the Washington Football club is excluded from this conversation because it's racist and it's not funny. Oh, and I don't even want to make okay. light of it. And, and so, sa same with Cleveland, even though they retired finally Yahoo. But we'll we'll take out the racial stereotype ones. We'll, we'll, we'll take out we'll take out Cleveland too. Um, we'll take out Cleveland. We'll take out Washington. We'll take out any sure. any Native American mascots because that's so there's that's funny. there. I think there's really there's really two answers for this question, and I, I'm going to go with wh one pulls closer to my heart, but one I think more makes more logical sense, and I'm going to go with the more logical sense that. And this isn't just like I don't like your logo because I actually don't. The logo's not fine. There's worse logos, and and like I don't like the name Minnesota Wild at all. I think it's one of the worst names in sports, but it's not ill fitting of the place it's from. the The worst is Utah Jazz. <laughs> like you, Utah Jazz. Like you don't like black people. You try to not let them be members of your your church. Uh, you 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 probably don't. Uh, yeah, like Utah Jazz in Salt Lake City. Like uh, there is nothing that makes sense about that. Like I, you know, in New Orleans, that is perfect, right? Like that's spot on. One of the best names you could possibly have in Salt Lake City. That is ridiculous. Like you need to you need to have changed to that when you moved and I'm glad the Bulls beat your ass every single time because your your name is stupid and um you know like your gay people kill each other all the time because you're horrible to them so fuck you you touch ass <laughs> Maya uh 
I'm going to tell you what, I'm just going to stop it right now and spare you because Luke put down the name I have written down, which is the Utah Jazz. So, so and, and it's funny because I, I had three in my head. Uh, Lakers doesn't make sense because there aren't lakes in L.A. and Minnesota got fucked in that deal. So that that one pulls at my heartstrings. I hate Real Salt Lake, even though that's one of my favorite teams because it's just like a shameless attempt to piggyback mm-hmm. off a more popular team. But yeah, Utah Jazz is. Yeah, I mean, you know... The Utah Chastity, sure. <laughs> the, the Utah Jello Salads, okay, I can get behind that. The Utah Jazz, no, there is no place on earth that has less to do with jazz than Utah. It's like the Sierra Leone Polar Bears. It's just <laughs> ridiculous. You shouldn't even attempt it. So, I'm sorry, Maya, I was pulling you're not for sorry. you. Don't apologize, you're had, not sorry. Don't apologize when you're not sorry. Don't apologize when you're not sorry. We question. shouldn't have even, we shouldn't have even had this, this discussion because Luke had already won. No, three to two. I, I couldn't have time. I had a secret tiebreaker question. I was going to bust out. I feel like the integrity of this game is in question. I mean, like it's it's, it's almost know. like an arbitrary it's opinion based arbitrary game has based, no. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost as if the rules are what we make them. So <laughs> I, I wanted you, and also to I wanted you in because also I am really sick of Luke winning this. But I do have to honor kind of the one rule we actually have. Which is that if it's written down and you get it, you got to go with it. Which is so, impressive because I think between us, we got like five written answers out of seven. That is true. Um, Which might I be a record. One, you, you didn't get my Spice Girls one, uh, and you didn't get my, um, uh, my Titanic. Well, you didn't get Spice Girls, you didn't get the worst lyrics, and you didn't get the LA or the um, Titanic. Oh, well, you did reference it. I but, did. All right. Shut up. My music's playing, y'all. Boosh! And or cacao. So let's go, let's go crazy. Let's get nuts. Let's go for the melody. Let's go. I guess you can dare a lick my balls, Capitan. Hey, Mark. Yes, Maya? Hey, Luke. Yo. I saw a trailer. In fact, I saw two on one hand. We have the nostalgia-heavy Bumblebee, and on the other, we have Detective Pikachu. Let's start with the latter first. I'm having trouble getting past Deadpool being the voice of Pikachu. What would you guys think about this trailer? Uh, Luke, please feel free. Take it away. Uh, I actually liked everything about this trailer except for what you exactly brought up. Like, I don't know if there's an actor in the world that is disappears less into a role than Ryan Reynolds. So, like, to throw him into a voice role like this, like, just, you, you might as well just have him act it out. Just just put some yellow paint on him and have him be Pikachu. Don't even do the, the CGI because I cannot separate him from that. He does the same thing in every role. Um, and, and it looks like he's going to do more of the same here, which is too bad because I kind of, if you, when you wrote that, when I heard about this concept before I saw the trailer, I was like, this is the dumbest shit I've ever heard of. But I thought for most parts of the trailer, it kind of worked for me. Like, it looked like a fun world. It looked like kind of a fun idea. Like, I didn't take it too seriously. It looked like it could be kind of a fun romp. But I just don't want to see Ryan Reynolds be Ryan Reynolds in another movie. Because it's it, it just drags me down. I have a question and a point. My first question is, how many times through this trailer did you think a friend of the show, Aiden, yelling, Squirtle! Oh my god, yeah, especially the squirrel missing poster. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I look no, at this. That's, that's an inside baseball joke for everybody who did not. Appear. Dude, we're like 52 minutes into this episode. Everyone quit listening. I, <laughs> I, look, I look at people who, who are into this movie. Like, I think my dad looks at me for being into superhero films. Like, I love that you guys are in it, but I'm not going to pretend like I get it. I miss the whole boat on Pokemon. Pikachu looks cute. Um, I'm kind of surprised that they didn't just do a straight up P- or Pokemon movie, you know, with that whole thing to start off. Well, they've, they've done some animated ones, and they haven't they haven't taken off. So really? I think they wanted to go with a little bit of a, a, a twist on it. And for me, that worked from what See, I've seen. I'm, like, it's a casting thing for me. I'm with Maya. I was watching this, and the entire time, I mean, I realize I'm a 40-something uh, aging man. You know, I'm getting old. I like to go to bed by 9 o'clock. I eat sensibly low-sodium diets. I, I have hemorrhoid issues. So I get that I'm not the target market anymore. For, for pop culture and movies, but I don't get who this movie's for. Um, it, it, is it for, I mean, you know, people like Pokemon, I mean, that, that's like little kids, right? But we're making it adult, sort of like Roger Rabbit, but we're not, it just, it doesn't, 
it doesn't make sense to me who this film is marketed to. And it seems to me you kind of be straddling this weird nebulous area of it's going to be too grown up for kids and it's going to be too kids for grown ups. See, I, and, I, I think it, it's a created in marketing department type approach where they go, we'll try and make a more adult story because then maybe we can capture the adults that played this when they, you know, that are kind of like late thirties or whatever that may have done this when they were, when they were kids. And then we will also, because it's just Pokemon, then their kids will want to go because the kids still, at least at, at my son's school, not my son, he got a couple packs because other kids were, but then quickly got rid of them. Um, but people do play this or whatever still. Like, it's it's still a thing. F- f- uh, friend of the show, Fuzzhead's brother works for Pokemon, uh, actually, in Seattle. But, um, so I, I feel like this is kind of like a marketing department went, this is how we can capture the two demographics we think care about Pokemon and we'll smash them together, which means it probably won't work but for this, anyone. This is how superhero films, the building on the nostalgia of that, this is how building on the nostalgia of Star Wars, how it's been successful. I think that it's just the next half generation after us. Like, the people who are younger than us love Pokemon. And I think right. I think this will be a successful film. And right. this is like a deep cut. Like, there is a Detective Pikachu. I was reading a little bit about it. There is a Detective Pikachu, I don't know if it's show or series or something. And so this is kind of a deep cut for those people. I think that I think it's going to be successful, guys. But see, I, I get that. But the thing is, is that when they're making movies based on nostalgia, there is still is you either commit and you do the kid version or you do a grown-up version. Like, when the Marvel movies and, in, in, you know, like Captain America – Yes, it is a you know a comic book and something where as a child, but they're not doing the silly ones where you know he gets turned into a werewolf, right? They're not doing the kitty silly ones. They're making a more adult story, and that's why this movie to me it never felt like I could. Is this a kids movie? Is an adults movie using the tropes of kids for nostalgia? It just it it I was never going to see this anyway, but I'm really not now um, unless I find out that there is at least one. Uh, joke where Pikachu's talking about pegging, and if that happens, then then I might be in. Oh, it's I, a it's a Ryan Reynolds Deadpool sex reference. I think uh, I, I honestly think Boo I is going to love this confused. movie, so I'm going to take her to it because I think she loves Pikachu. So. Oh yeah, well, and there you go, and that's and that's what I think they're going for. They're like, your kid will want to see this because they saw Pikachu, so we'll try and make it something that you might enjoy, which means it'll probably fail on all levels because those type of things normally do Worked but once with shrek that's it and just the first one and that movie does not hold up because all it is is pop culture references so once it gets dated it's the worst thing ever to watch but i you know just hey, hey just... the smash mouth holds up oh I yeah know. we've seen them live together um they op- <laughs> they, they opened for you two oh, um and they you two let them they had one album and you two let them play for i think 45 50 minutes which <laughs> Was more than what I was think the their Scooby album was. Snake? When I saw you two, did you? Was it Pop Mart that you saw him? We saw Pop Mart, okay, and we got Smash Mouth. But you saw this? Was that the Bloodhound Gang? The Scooby was Snacks? That the Scooby Snacks? Yeah, yeah that's what I saw. That the no, that was the Bloodhound Gang. Pretty sure that the was. Bloodhound Gang was awesome. I'm pretty sure they were Scooby Snacks. No, I I think you're wrong. We're gonna have to consult Uncle Google here. I I really want to say because and then they also had the follow up, which was the the Discovery Channel. Um. Oh, it was fun loving criminals. You're right. I was wrong. It was fun loving criminals. Yeah. Same thing. Whatever. Speaking yeah. of criminals, let's talk about criminals. Bumblebee. Should we go there? Who wants to start off? I, I'm going to start off there because I I already have a feeling on where this is going to go, and it seems to be that I always have the differing opinion or whatever. I think this is a a uh, perfect course correction from what I've seen of what they were doing with Transformers. Um, this is, this is Transformers that actually you see transform. Uh, it didn't look like it was going to be four hours of just massive explosions and Transformers that I couldn't even decipher where their eyes were, their faces were because they're just weird CGI messes. Um, you know, Soundwave actually had videotapes jump out of his chest or whatever. Um, you know, this, this is Transformers that, that we remember. And I think this is a franchise that does really well in Japan or in China and all those other places, but it's a franchise that's declining in America because it's a big fucking mess. And and the way to course correct that is, is to give us what we know. And that is a, a bumblebee that turns into the car. We know 
that is the the designs of Transformers we know, and that is to make it a little bit more character based, almost like the first one or like the actual Transformers show where it's the re- relationship between uh, a less annoying kid, I would say, in Steinfeld than in Shia LaBeouf, and uh, and and less Transformers because some of those movies, not that I've I've seen all of the Transformer movies, but suddenly you have 50 Transformers and you don't know who is who and none of them look like you remember. And um, I'm watching it with my kid and he doesn't even know what what one's a robot and what one's not because they just look like messes. So for me, I, I don't love these movies. I'm not going to see this movie. Um, but if you were going to tell me you're making a Transformer movie, this, this hit the beats that I wanted. This is it, it felt familiar and less chaotic. No, I, I agree with you. I was especially impressed uh, by the CGI and the fact that I could actually tell what I was looking at with these Transformers. Um, so that was a definite improvement, and that made me a little more inclined to see it. However, my problem with the trailer was uh, also similar to what I had with the other movies to begin with, is that it's a lot of humans talking to one Transformer. Now, I didn't watch the cartoon or the original and still the best Transformers animated show to watch Spike and his dad talk <laughs> to Bumblebee, right? I want to see Optimus Prime punch Shockwave. I want to see Starscream plotting to overtake the leadership. I want to see a giant planet-eating planet. Voiced eat by Orson planet. Welles. Right? Exactly. While he's drunk and dying. I don't want to see John Cena. I don't want to see a woman fall in love with Herbie. It, so it, it's, it might be fine if this is prelude to an actual Transformers movie in the vein, you know, live action, but in the vein of what we had as kids. I don't want to see humans. I mean, you know, John Cena, okay, he's a little more ripped than Josh Duhamel, but I don't care. I, uh, I, I, and, and I think that's what this is going to lead into. My, my guess is you're going to have this movie conclude with a after credit scene that is the rest of the Transformers coming. Cause I mean, this is a soft reboot, right? Like it's, it's in the yeah. same universe or whatever, but they're changing a lot of stuff. I believe it's set in the eighties. Um, this is a soft reboot so that they can redo what's basically gone massively, massively off the rails. So I think they're kind of going, we're going to do it small scale. We'll get that right. And then we'll lead into the big one, which will be, be coming next. That would be my guess on it. I know that there is one of us above all that has thoughts on this movie. And it's time we heard from him. Look, this has been a great few years. They just keep making movies for me. They made three great Captain America movies. They made three... Well, they made two great Avengers movies and one okay Avengers movie. I thought you loved the all I, I It fades. I mean, it's okay. not as good. I mean, I, I like it a lot, but I, I don't want to say it's great. Um, they made Solo for me. They made a Fantastic Four that was built off the ultimate Fantastic Four for me. But you don't... They keep... Okay, I'm sorry. I don't want to... Yeah. Just, do you like Fantastic Four or are you just intrigued by Fantastic the, Four? The, the 2015 movie? Yeah. I love everything up to when it says one year later. Okay. So, I love half of the movie. But back to my point, they just keep making this movie for me. I want to take you back, um, sandwiched between my love of Batman and Voltron from ages 4 to 6, Transformers were my favorite thing in the world, and for me, there was only one true Transformer, and that was Bumblebee. I took the thing, I had the little toy, I took it literally with me everywhere. I slept next to my Bumblebee toy, I kept it in my backpack at school, and I had some rough days in my life, but easily making the top 10 was when I dropped my beloved Bumblebee into the toilet. Um, It's one of the most disappointing franchises in movie history to a lot of people, but I didn't even make it that far because when Bumblebee was made into a Camaro, I refused to watch even further and started talking shit to the the movie screen in a packed house. I was that guy, and I even walked out of the movie theater at that point. I will see this. I will see this in the fucking theater. Like, I am Mr. Nostalgia on this show. That is well documented. And this is fucking hitting me. Like, Bumblebee, it's cute Bumblebee. And then he gets all fucking, like, anger. You know, he has, like, the special face for that. It's everything that I wanted when I heard there was going to be a Transformers movie. Like, this is my goddamn movie, and I'm going to see it. I don't know if it's opening night, but I'm going to fucking see this movie. Well, I'm happy for you, because I actually thought this was going to go another way. Did you? I did. I really did. I really thought you were going to hate this. Why? Uh, you, you seem to lately have gone reverse nostalgia. 
I thought on us, you know, it, maybe I'm, I'm putting it through the, you kind of seem to have reversed your, your, you like, you still love the force or uh, yeah, the force awakens, but you're kind of like whenever, and you love solo, but whenever they're like, we're going to focus on Bubba Fett or we're going to focus on this. You're like, I want a bigger world. And I, and I was kind of like, where did this come from? Because you've loved the smaller world. So I was ready for you to give a rant about how you, you're sick of nostalgia and you wanted people to move on from nostalgia, which was going to surprise me because I was like, watching which i'm assuming is a flashback but there seems to be a lot of stuff on cybertron and you have a, you know an accurate optimus prime you have an accurate shockwave you have an accurate starscream and i was just like fuck that's awesome or whatever that's so was exactly like, what i want to see yeah, the like, whole the time the this is like, what i wanted to see back in the mid 2000s when it fucking first started coming out and now they're giving popped, it to me man tapes popped out of his chest I know. <laughs> it was fucking perfect yeah. <laughs> so yeah i'm gonna see it i love it all right I, I, I am not going to see it. However, I'm going to listen to the reactions and the response and what it could possibly set up. And if, like Luke said, it is going towards that reboot where we get a movie where the humans are irrelevant and it's just, you know, punching and getting drunk on Energon cubes, then I will be on board for that one. It's, it's a solid it's a solid I'm looking for Redbox movie for me. Well, I think we should get to some other nerd news. What are we at for time? Actually, on this actually, before oh, we I'm do sorry. that, I'm sorry. Um, I actually have a, a question that got sent in to Kid Seriously. Really? Oh, wow. That's and right. We used to do a segment about questions. <laughs> this actually may push us um, well over our runtime because I think we're already going long. But I'm going to toss it out there anyway, and you know, maybe we just lose it on the editing floor. But um, I got this email from friend of the show, Garth. Hey! <laughs> hey, Kid Seriously. Wow. I am a Detroit Lions fan, and it's well known that the Detroit Lions are among the most pathetic, abysmal, disastrous teams that anybody has ever had the misfortune of cheering for. And I was just wondering, are there any fandoms who have it even worse than me? So thank you, Garth, for the question, and we'll tee it up to the gentleman. Cleveland Browns. Oh, well, and and that's... uh... I, I'm I'm gonna go with the fact that that the actual Garth didn't send that question in. Uh, d- no, just, no, no, he did talk about how pathetic and awful and disappointing the Lions. Were. I, gu- I guess I I suppose I suppose it it it's how you classify fandoms, right? Because if you're a fan of the Lions, you're a fan of generally a fan of Detroit sports, and you've done pretty fucking well, right? Like the Red Wings are awesome. The Pistons won a championship not that long ago. Um, the Tigers have been relevant in the last few years. They made a couple World Series, haven't won them, but they won World Series in the 80s. Um, so your overall fandom is is pretty, pretty good as far as pro sports goes. I mean, there can't be a worse individual franchise to cheer for than the Browns, right? Like, that's that's bare bottom. Like, that, there's nothing worse from that. But, like, if you look at individual cities, Cleveland's still got to be up there. But they did get their... The their title team with team LeBron. Team. They got their one title with LeBron. They got a couple World Series with the Indians that they weren't able to to pull off. I mean, let's be honest. There's one major market with four to five major sports that has the longest drought as of uh, last June without winning a major title, and that is Minneapolis-St. Paul, right? Because mm-hmm. uh, it, it was a tie with Washington, D.C., but they won the Stanley Cup last year. So... Technically, the the longest you know major market is the the Twin Cities, right? Because it's been ninety one since they last won a title, and and that is a male title and a professional male title, D one male title, right? Because like Gophers w- have won hockey championships, the Lynx, Lynx have won four titles, you know, in the last eight years, and uh, the the Minnesota United when they were a level down won a championship as well. But for men's you know, the, the four, even five major sports, like Minnesota's got the longest drought. So Mark and I are living in it. See, I was thinking, and, and I'm not sure that I'm sold on this, but I'm thinking that Vikings fans may actually have it even worse than Browns fans. Because the one thing you got, that's some, you're embarrassing yourself. No, no, because the one thing that separates the two is hope. Browns fans never have hope. They never have the rug pulled out from under them. They go in knowing it's a slog. Whereas Vikings fans have consistently been brought to the brink 
only to be cut down at the most crucial moments. I feel like your right? lack of 1980s NFL knowledge is showing because the Cleveland was to the brink so many times in the 80s and, and uh, I think maybe well, 98. Like... Tied for the most Super Bowl losses. Uh, so, not anymore. The Patriots by far have the most Super Bowl losses. But yeah, no. because remember they've lost they've lost what three in the Tom Brady era. Right. Um, they lost to the Packers and the Bears. They didn't lose okay. to the Packers. Oh yeah, beforehand. Just... Yeah, the, but they they've lost seven. But my my point is outside of that is that and, and my I'm a Vikings fan, so I know the highs and the lows. I'm a Chicago Fire fan, and I know lows. <laughs> All I know is lows. Just. <laughs> horrible horrific so you bad. think it can't get worse and it they does. somehow manage to do worse all the time sean maloney who we spent all this money on is too tired to play because he can't adjust to time changes after three months <laughs> um like we're we're that bad a franchise and i will tell you that um yeah like getting blown out by the eagles sucked like losing to the saints in the nfc championship game was horrific like uh you know the 98 loss to the atlanta falcons when we were 15 and one and by far the best team in the nfl like that th those are pit of the stomach losses but stefan diggs man like um you know randy moss. randy moss at lambo like you don't get those moments with the cleveland browns i don't get those moments with the chicago fire like just this bitter emptiness of never having anything even remotely fun to cling on to is so much worse than the roller coaster that is Viking fandom. All right. Well, just thought I would toss it out there. Uh, thank you again, Garth, for the question. We really appreciate it. And now, moving on. I'm a nerd. We have news for the beautiful people. There's a lot more of us in our view. All right. We got other nerd news here. And Luke, I think you had some things that you wanted to talk about. It is my time. I'm going to bring up what I've been dying to bring up that I brought up once before that no one else cares about, but I fucking love, which is The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina on Netflix. It is fantastic, and they just announced they're going to have a Christmas special, which I cannot wait for, but I have to wait till the middle of December, which is kind of a drawback, because like they only gave us ten episodes, and it's like, how can you leave us hanging like that? Because it's so fucking good. Like, it's... It's it's horror and it's dark and it but it's good performances and they also talk about some you know you know things like uh, um, you know rape in high schools and uh, you know kids struggling with their gender identity and I, like there's so much going on there that I enjoy but it, it still feels light at the same time but it still feels dark and scary I love it but it's also one of those things where like. I, I'm telling you guys about it, and I, I'm preaching it, but, like, it's not like I, like, race into conversations to be like, hey, hey, friends, are you watching The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina just like I am? Or whatever. So, my thought in talking about it is, is, like, everyone's got something that in their life, right? Everyone has got a show they watch, or a, a book they love, or a band they love, or whatever, which, like, you just unabashedly love, and you don't tell people about because you're worried about what other people will say or how they'll judge you because it isn't something that whoever you are traditionally should be watching by, you know, whatever cultural norms. So, I threw mine out there. It's your guys' turn. Throw yours out there. Maya, you want to go? Uh, I can go. Um, I, I'm maybe not embarrassed about this, but... Uh, I absolutely love the movie Idiocracy and don't fathom why it's not a bigger deal. I quote this movie all the time and no one picks up on it because no one's seen it. It is one of, it is a fucking masterpiece of comedy and social commentary. And I don't care what anybody says, it's probably Mike Judge's greatest work, um, even more than Office Space, which I also love. It is one of the great and underappreciated films of all time, and this question has got me wanting to watch it on Wednesday. I have the day off of work Wednesday is when my vacation starts, and I think I'm going to watch it Wednesday. Upgrade. So mine's a, a little similar to mine, but not exactly, in that I'm not embarrassed about it, but I don't understand why... I love it so much and other people don't share the same level of enthusiasm. And that's mystery science theater 3000, which I know on its surface sounds kind of silly because anybody who's seen it, they'll generally say, Oh yeah, that's pretty funny. Or, oh yeah. I like it. But I insanely love this show. I mean, my, some of my fondest holiday memories are, are Luke of you and I doing the Turkey day marathons. 
of just watching it nonstop. I mean, I got to see them do it live here in Portland uh, just a week and a half ago. And there's a new season coming out on Netflix. And yeah, okay, the new host, John Ray, may not be as great as, as Joel or, or Mike, but it's still hilarious. And it's still the same kind of, you know, do-it-yourself comedy. And, you know, it's also a little bummer that it's not as Minnesota-centric as it used to be, which, you know, was always kind of fun in jokes for us. But, you know, you tell people about it and they're like, oh, yeah, I remember that show. It was funny. It was a good time. And, and I just want to shake them and say, they're still making more. There's a new season coming. They're doing a marathon right now streaming online. And there's going to be new ones on Netflix. And people are just like, yeah, okay. And I, I just I don't get why people don't have the same level of enthusiasm for this. And I don't know. Maybe I just hang out with the wrong people. But – I like to feel like I've been in circles where it should be more greatly appreciated and it really just isn't. And it drives me insane. I used to like that show. That's, that's See? I, and and I, I used to watch the new season on Netflix and I wasn't that impressed. I used to, I used to watch, you know, like I, I watched it as much as Mark did and we would watch those marathons on Thanksgiving and I've never even attempted to start the new season. Just, just never. I was just like, I don't want to sit down and watch this for two hours. Just never. Maybe See? my attention span's cut out, but I've just never found the enthusiasm to attempt it. Well, I, w- I want to thank you two at least for showing the fans exactly what I'm talking about. You two, you should be loving this. You guys should be right in queue with me to be seeing this, and you're not, and it drives me insane. Can't. I'm prepping for the Christmas special with Sabrina. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to watch Idiocracy. You know, maybe I'll fit something in. I'll probably watch half an episode for you. I was excited with the Netflix when it came out. Speaking of excited, I'm excited that this is probably going to end. Uh, Luke, where can they find you? Uh, they can find us, if they're still with us, on the longest episode ever, at Luke underscore Neitzel, N-E-I-T-Z-L, on Twitter. Mark? You can find me at Wink Martindale underscore 5. At is Twitter. there an underscore? Uh, is there? there might I don't be. think so. I don't know. I think you're Wink, at Wink, Wink Martindale 5. Martindale. You'll find it. It's, it's on the uh, YouTube screen, the new YouTube screen I created. That's a nice job. No one, oh, you noticed. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. And me, I'm at Maya Madrid and saying, uh, how much O'Keefe? Miles O'Keefe. Oh my God. <laughs>Thanks for listening to Kids Seriously. If you didn't completely hate us, feel free to hit like, subscribe, or tell a friend about the show. If you want to write to us and tell us how much we suck, or just ask a question, you can reach us at kidsseriouslyradio at gmail.com. Otherwise, hit us up on Twitter at kidsseriously. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.